Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is an inspiring trailblazer who has focused her career on innovation in mechanical and systems engineering and design. She's an instructor for technology and national security at Stanford University, where she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering and where she is currently pursuing her PhD. She's also the founder of fast growing Silicon Valley startup that is modernizing the geospatial software industry. Forbes Magazine has recognized her as a top 30 under 30 leader. We're excited to welcome founder and CEO of Geosite, Rachel Olney. Well, Rachel, thank you for being with us today. It's great to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you too, Joe. You know, I know, Rachel, we had spoken not long ago, and you've accomplished a lot of really great things. You both have a master's and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford, PhD candidate. You started a phenomenal startup called Geosite that we'll talk about. Before we get into that, tell us a little bit about kind of what led you to where you are today. Yeah, I think one of the things about anytime somebody tells a story about what led them to where they are is how many unexpected twists and turns there are before you end up doing something like starting a company. I started at Stanford as an undergrad thinking I would go into Aero Astro, you know, was determined to do that. And then slowly ended up getting absorbed into the design program at Stanford. So Stanford has the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design or the D school as it's called outside. And I loved how they were always working on problems that were really unconstrained. So they were human problems and engineering problems and therefore messy enough that there were no perfect solutions. And I found that to be really interesting, thought I would go out into the world and be a product designer. And then I discovered that manufacturing is fascinating because, you know, it's this intricate sort of systems where efficiency matters down to half of a degree, right. Or even less than that became very fascinated by it. And at the same time, I was also starting to work on various national security stuff at Stanford and Stanford has CSAC, the center for international security and cooperation. And there they act as a liaison between Stanford and the engineering and scientific efforts that are going on and the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And as I got absorbed into that world, I started getting to do all sorts of projects across the DOD and IC. You can see how ultimately it was just this snowball that kept happening. So I kept running across different things and saying yes, as doors opened and opportunities opened. So I ended up teaching technology and national security at Stanford for oh, I don't know, six years, I think at this point, this will actually be my first year not teaching. And I'm so sad. I'll go back for one lecture, but that's it. And at the time I was studying mechanical engineering still and ended up with the opportunity to study cyber command in the NSA and look at how are the engineering teams inside of the Department of Defense and these various national security agencies functioning and how are they creating new things? And so it ended up being a very entertaining kind of path because here's an engineer who's now doing organizational theory, who's now, you know, embedded with various cyber command teams, but actually still studying manufacturing and, you know, just kind of this tangled mess of interesting things going on. And I think that how I ended up where I am is taking advantage of opportunities where I saw that there were few people with expertise that I had or experiences that I had where I could make an impact. And so my PhD work ended up being really fascinating, but then ended up putting me in a situation where there were very few people who had the level of engineering expertise, but also bureaucracy navigation expertise that I had around national security. And so as I wrapped up my PhD, you know, I started to think about what's next. And for me, I realized I wanted to leverage that intersection between engineering expertise and being able to navigate the politics and the policies 
of national security. And so what's interesting about geocide is there were actually a series of problems that I wanted to solve that, you know, each of them were extraordinarily important. There ended up being, you know, a couple of stories that pushed me towards what we ended up solving at geocide, but where it all really stemmed from was kind of a reflection of what are the things that I can do that nobody else knows how to, or has had the opportunity to gain the experiences to actually make a difference. So that's my winding story of thinking I'd be a designer and then thinking I'd go into manufacturing. I spent two years learning Mandarin, right? Like I was like, this is it, this is the path. And then ending up realizing that there is a niche in national security that I could fill in terms of translating between technology and national security, and then ending up starting a company. I guess with all of that, the thing I most want to express is not getting caught in a sunk cost fallacy about, you know, your own pathway as you're figuring out what to do. So Rachel, one of the things I want to ask you about is this sunk cost fallacy. Having been a lawyer and leaving the practice of law, people would say, gosh, how can you do that? You've got so much invested. And my sense is that, you know, there's people do have that mindset, but you've got this eclectic background. You're doing all kinds of things and you're learning Mandarin and involved in national security and so forth. Was it an openness of complete experience trying to see where the path led. What was the thought process at that point that kind of let you, you know, go from thing to thing to thing? The funny thing is it's easy to kind of look backwards and pretend like I was okay with this ambiguity the whole time. Like, oh yes, I was totally fine. Just like following these opportunities and, you know, whatever, but I'm absolutely the kind of person who thinks I can have a 10 year plan. Like I'm always sitting here saying, here's exactly what's going to happen next. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do these things, always strategizing what I'm going to do. And I think I've gotten better about not doing that. I mean, this goes way, way, way back, right? Like how I was raised was you find the places where you can make a difference. And so I think it was more of a reflection of, oh, Hey, over here, there's this problem. And I think think that I can actually really help with it. Right. Or, oh, you know what? I think that the way my brain functions, this is something that I am particularly skilled for or like predisposed towards succeeding in. Right. I think where a lot of it stemmed was self-reflection and then I'd be okay changing my path because I'd say, Hey, I think that going down this other path, even though it's not what I expected, either a is actually a better fit for my natural skill set or things that I care about, or B, somewhere where I can make a real difference. And anytime those intersected, disrupting my plan felt natural. And I have to say that there are advisors and friends and folks who have pushed me off my path, sometimes in a overt way, sometimes in a covert way, right? Like the friend who says, hey, I think you should really do this entrepreneurship fellowship, right? Because they're seeing something about a possibility in my future that I wasn't yet. I was like, no, 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 I'm never going to start a company. And he was like, oh, I think you should do this fellowship just in case, right? So I think that there would be moments typically that I can look back at. And those were the points at which it diverged, right? So in manufacturing, I still... Anywhere I go, I will find every factory tour and I will be there and I will just love it. You know, if anybody is in uh, Denver, go to the Celestial Sea Sphinx factory. It literally made me tear up because it's the most efficient factory I've ever seen in my life. I love, 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 love that field. There are a lot of very capable engineers who love manufacturing, right? And so once I got the opportunity to affect policy around how engineering teams function, in the US military, like that is an opportunity you don't get very often. And I knew that I could make a difference to be an advocate for engineers that were in uniform because they needed an external advocate. And so it's really, there would just be these like little inflection points where someone would be like, hey, can you help with this? And I'd be like, absolutely. And, you know, I think it ended up being more iterative than I'd like to pretend. No, but it's great because what I'm taking away from this is that you were open to different opportunities. You're looking for the places where you can have impact. Someone suggests something and you don't rule it out. Many times people are very linear in their career path. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. You took a different way and it's really worked out very well for you. Yeah. And I think it becomes over time more and more of a trust fall, right? Like, everything circles back around. You learned something along the way. And then later on you go down this path and that other skill set that you built becomes valuable without you even realizing it. Right. So like manufacturing is all about, like I said, efficiency, right? Like I can draw a process diagram, like no one's business. And now I'm at a software company where 
you know, we are helping people with massive, massive logistics and operational problems try to be more efficient and more accurate. Talk about a process problem, right? Like it's not a factory, but it's the exact same mode of thinking. And so I think that even if you are switching how you're applying things that you've learned over your career, they're still there with you. And it can be a really strong differentiator, actually, if you're jumping to somewhere where maybe that skill set doesn't exist. And so I think the willingness to be in over your head, right? So it's like, great, I've been doing this thing. I'm an expert at it. I'm going to go over there where I have no idea what's going on and just like get pushed in the deep end of the pool and trust that it will be okay. Because one, I can learn fast Two, whatever these other skills I have are, I'm going to bring those to the table and I might have to stop people 500 times and say, Hey, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you please explain this to me? And you'll be okay. Right. And so I think that's what it takes. What you're describing though, is the level of courage. It's a level of self-confidence that gave you the willingness to do that. What is the source of that for you? Practice. I mean, I think there are some people who are blindly, naturally brave and courageous. I think for myself, I've been in over my head so many times and it's turned out okay that I've gotten to a point where it doesn't scare me walking into a situation where I don't know what's going on. It's really just, I think those first few times thinking, you know what, life is short. I'm going to try this. I might really fail, but it'll at least be interesting. And if you're working really hard, you're not going to fail, especially if you approach things, you know, with the beginner's mindset, right? Is a big deal. I think people let their egos get in the way of asking questions that can help them grow, right? So being able to walk into that situation. And I think one of my gifts is being unintimidatable, but like you're sitting at that table with these folks who are extraordinary, whatever it is, and being able to say, Hey, that doesn't make sense to me. Is that because it doesn't make sense or because I'm missing something? Can you explain it? That beginner's mindset of like, it's okay. You don't know everything. And you're always going to learn things when you're in over your head. That skill is really, really important because a lot of people will sit there quietly and not know what's going on. And they just end up further behind in terms of being helpful in those sorts of situations. Rachel, what advice would you give someone who fears being over their head? The best advice is like, go find a spot where you're way in over your head. It will feel so uncomfortable. And I think being able to like take a step back and detach your ego from what you know, from what you think of yourself and being able to say like, Hey, I'm not going to get this right. I'm probably going to embarrass myself, but who cares? It will be fine. I think like just repeating that to yourself is helpful. So we were talking, you know, a couple of weeks ago and I had been mentioning I was going on a trip and then I came back. I was on a trip by myself to a foreign country that I've never been to. Right. And I think that even is a way that I push myself to be uncomfortable. I will get on a plane, go somewhere where I don't speak a language. I like didn't even think about looking up ahead of time what currency they use because I was really busy. And it's like, you get there and you sort it out. And I think subjecting yourself to some of those situations where you don't have the information, like it can be any type of situation. It doesn't only have to be professional. It can be, hey, I'm going to like buy these golf clubs off Craigslist and show up to a golf course and see what happens, right? Like it's just introducing yourself to all sorts of situations where you're unprepared, I think can be a good way to practice. There's no easy way around it. You just gotta, gotta jump in. It is like a muscle though, right? I mean, the more you do it, even in small things, people are afraid they're indecisive. We can all be that way sometimes, but when we do things in small matters and then you, you try things in big ones, it really can work out very well. Exactly. Humans are creatures of habit, right? Like we all are. I think being able to observe yourself getting into kind of a routine, there are some routines that are helpful and there are some that are not. And knowing when to break that routine, I think could be really important. Awesome. I want to ask you about Geosite. Before I do, you had started to talk about the sunk cost fallacy. Would like to have you talk about that. I mean, the sunk cost fallacy is this idea that, you know, people will continue to invest in something beyond what is logical, right? Like you put effort into something, you've reached a point where actually putting in a more effort doesn't make sense, but emotionally, you don't want to let go of the effort that you've already put in. The Stanford undergrad design program was where I learned to 
not mind letting things go very quickly if they weren't working. Like the design program there is always like, don't fall in love with the baby, right? Like whatever this prototype is or whatever this idea is or whatever. And I think that doing that broadly in life can be really important. Being able to say, hey, I had these assumptions when I went in, I did these things, it didn't work. And so I want to go do something else or this idea turned out not to be correct. One of the really interesting things about it is what helps with solving, falling into some cost fallacy is detaching your ego and self-worth from your ideas and plans. Like the fact that your ideas or plans didn't work out isn't a reflection on your ability or your worth or your skills or whatever. In fact, your ability to revisit those ideas and plans and say, you know what? Actually, this is not correct. Or, hey, I learned something and this is wrong. Or, hey, actually, I came up with this other idea and it's even better. Or somebody else comes up to you and says, hey, that's a really dumb idea. Actually, this thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. And this ability to like detach the two, I think helps with not falling into some cost fallacy because I think a lot of people attach their identity to specific objects of their work rather than the process of their work or their ability to be agile or their ability to learn new things or whatever. And if you think about it, it's a very constraining way to see your own expertise or potential if it's attached to a single thing, right? Like a single idea or a single plan. Like, you know, you were mentioning earlier, you're a trained lawyer and like you're not acting as a lawyer. And if you had attached your entire identity to that, you couldn't have gone off and done other things where maybe, you know, you're contributing more to the world or more fulfilled or things like that. It's great to hear you say that because I think too often people get so focused on one particular thing, working or not working, and then fear comes in. The reality is that, you know, we've got this one life. Why live with regret? right? I mean, let's go for it. Exactly. And then you go jump in the deep end of the pool, right? Like those go hand in hand. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So speaking of jumping into the deep end of the pool, you started a company, Geosite. You said you hadn't had really management experience or managed significant teams before you started this. You built this into a more significant company or a Forbes 30 under 30 award recipient. What is Geosite? What led you to form Geosite? And tell us a little bit about the business. Yeah. So Geosite is a software company, right? We have a platform and applications. And what we are focused on is business operations and business intelligence applications that leverage spatial data. So by spatial data, I mean everything from satellites to drones, to satellite analytics, to IOT data, things like that. If there's data and it references where it is on the earth, it's data that we can work with. And we'll put that into things like a couple of examples just to to make it concrete, because that makes it easier, is search and rescue. So we have a major search and rescue customer, and we're actually coordinating a massive part of search and rescue for the US. So, you know, a beacon goes off or there's a missing persons report or something like that. And how do you coordinate finding that person? You know, our software is the kind of thing that you can do that. Or for an insurance company for underwriting and claims, how are they layering? Here's where our buildings are. Here's the flood data. Here's the fire risk data. Here's all these things. Geosite is essentially where everything plugs in. And then there's these business processes right? That get run on the platform. Back to that, my love of manufacturing, right? Our company's all about the workflow and the process and bringing the data into that process rather than about the data itself. We can plug and unplug whatever data. That's what Geosite is. What led me to start it was, you know, I was at Stanford. This was during that period that I was talking about where I was working on my PhD. So I was embedding with all of these, you know, cyber capability teams in the DOD and, also working with a bunch of other units across national security. So essentially what happens is if you're at Stanford and you're a trained mechanical engineer and you're also studying org theory on how do you create new capabilities in the military, people start saying, oh yeah, there's this nerd at Stanford and she understands the bureaucracy and like we should bring her in and see what she thinks about this or that, right? So I got a bunch of opportunities to consult a bunch of groups on setting up their innovation groups inside of the Department of Defense. Talk about being way in over my head. One of our most elite teams reached out and was like, hey, we want you to come and train us on these different things and stay with us for this amount of time to do this stuff. And I'm like, 
okay, here I go, right? Like I'm going to go fly to this random place with these like special operations folks and it'll be fine. I know nothing about this unit other than that they're extraordinary and considered like our most elite unit. But yeah, sure. I'll hop on a plane. This will be fine. (laughs) While I was actually there, we were talking through, and this was again, towards the end of my PhD. So I was thinking about what's next. We were talking through what were each of the things that had caused casualties over the past couple of years and over and over again, their inability to pull together spatial data. So think satellite imagery, drawings of here's where there's problems, here's things you might need to know and you know, drone imagery and things like that. The ability to very, very rapidly pull it together so they can respond to something and have clarity was a huge problem and had actually caused casualties. So I get home, they always ask like, what keeps you up at night? This was literally keeping me up at night, right? So I'm like laying there just thinking there are literally people who are dying and there are missions that are failing because the plumbing doesn't exist to solve this problem. And it is both a technical problem and a bureaucratic problem. Because like in any major enterprise, different groups own different pieces of data and they don't necessarily always want to share, right? And so you have this issue of how do you get the right information to the right person as quickly as possible? And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, this is exactly my kind of problem. It is very, very technical, you know, dealing with spatial data is very hard and it's very bureaucratic, right? Like there are internal policy and politics and procedural things that are also creating this problem. It's not just a technical problem. So once I identified that it had clicked for me that, all right, I know what I'm doing next. So started Geosite. It was literally just me and a PowerPoint in the beginning when we went out for our first round of funding. And I was really lucky to find Garrett Goldberg. He's at B Partners and he was our first investor and literally invested in me and a PowerPoint. And I'm just like, Hey, I know this industry. I know there's a gap. I know that every you know large enterprise is trying to use spatial data. I know that all the tools out there are for scientists and engineers. I want to build the business operations and business intelligence software for spatial data. It was pretty exciting. And the team has grown so, so fast. The company's grown so fast. It's been a wild ride for sure. Well, and I know COVID was part of that ride. And there were some scary (laughs) scary times in that for your business. And you've made it through that. Yeah. Yeah. Like for any, right? Like we were in the energy industry. Oil hit negative futures in terms of price last spring. So that was definitely an interesting day when we're looking at what markets we're in. What are some of the challenges you've faced between starting the company and where it is today? What are some of the things that stand out as really defining moments in that business? For the business, I think the defining moments have been around us deciding what kinds of projects we want to work on. We've actually put a lot of work into, you know, we have pretty extensive values and ethics that we've laid out for ourselves. If you imagine how our software, and I think all technologists should do this, imagine how your software could be used as a weapon or used in ways that you would not want to use, right? If you think about our software, it can be wonderful for surveillance and surveillance can be a good thing or a bad thing. And so we knew right away that we wanted to have really tight constraints around what we do. So in terms of like defining moments for the business, I think there have been times where we've leaned into work or refused work in ways that I feel really proud of. In terms of, for me as an individual, you alluded to this at the top, you know, the biggest team I had led before Geosite was, you know, four mechanical engineers building a robotic dinosaur, right? Like, and now I'm, you know, in charge of a massive team and tons of really important work and customers and things like that. And so I think that probably some of the most like dynamic shifting things have been around how do you grow into that role, which I think can be a really fun experience. Any advice on how to grow into the role? As you say, you're over your head, you jumped in the deep end of the pool. So what advice do you have about growing into a role that you're maybe not prepared for entirely? Yeah. I mean, the kind of high level umbrella advice is make sure you have great, 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 great mentors and advisors. And it doesn't just have to be people who are super, super experienced. 
you know, I have an executive coach, right? And so he'll try to find gaps in my knowledge of like, oh, you need to know this skill or you need to know that skill, right? Like you're still in school, you're learning a new skill, but then also having peer mentors, right? Having friends around you who are also leading companies who are around your stage, because you can go to them very easily and say, Hey, have you guys started to think about this? Have you started to think about that? And then you're not just getting kind of a retrospective of like, okay, don't reinvent the wheel. Here's the wheel. You're talking to someone who's like, Hey, we're attaching the wheels to the cart. And what we found is if you twist the bolts this way, it goes on easier than if you twist it that way. Like all the little things that maybe somebody who's further in their career, it might seem like minutia to them. If you have those advisors and peers that are kind of closer to it, that's kind of the overarching advice. I would say the thing I struggled with the most, it was the rockiest moment for me in learning to lead was completely called out by a friend years before it happened. He said, the hardest thing for you is going to be when you're no longer an individual contributor. And he had said it and I noted it and I was like, okay, I trust this person's advice. I'm going to remember that he said this. And it only just happened this past year. We had finally rounded out kind of our senior leadership at the company. And so it was the first time that I wasn't the only person solely responsible for something like anything you could think of our software, you know, the validity of the data, you know, sales operations, like there is somebody else at the company who it is also their sole responsibility to make sure that those things happen. And when you've worked your entire life and back to this whole, like how you think about your own identity thing and your identity is attached to the excellence of your work. Once your work is other people, that's a huge shift, right? Once there's no work to actually point at and say, I did this thing. The, I did this thing now is me sitting in a meeting, sitting back, watching my team interact, making good decisions. Now that's the moment where I have to say, oh, I did this thing, right? And that's a huge fundamental shift in thinking about yourself as a leader. Your people are your product at that point. That's an issue that many people struggle with as they continue to get promoted and grow and whatever the role is, someone's a phenomenal salesperson, they become a sales manager and it's a completely different ball game or as someone is promoted into management or leadership and so forth. So you've become comfortable with this though. It sounds like you uh, overcome you know. that. Or, and and how, how, how did you get comfortable with it? Doing my best. I mean, I think I'm still a little bit in the middle of it, right? Which is the interesting thing about like just post series A, I think a lot of founders go through that, right? And I think there were a few months where it was just hard, right? And what was interesting is I realized it was a combination of things. And the piece of it that I didn't expect that I think is better just to lean into and get through is it's almost a period of mourning, right? And accepting that. So there's the, am I feeling fulfilled by my team and their work and all that? Absolutely. Right. And at first I thought that maybe was where it was hard was like, do I feel fulfilled by this type of activity that I haven't had to feel fulfilled by before? Cause I could be fulfilled by, you know, my actual contributions, individual contributions. It wasn't actually that what was interesting was it was like, if you had trained your entire life to be the best violinist and the best oboist and the best, you know, whatever. And like, you can pick up any instrument and you can become the best at it. And now you have to step back and you don't get to touch any of the instruments anymore. I think getting through that is really just a, it takes time sort of thing. And it takes looking straight at it and saying, Hey, for me to get to do the things at the scale that I want to do, this is just a fact. I've always loved my team. I love, 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 love them. Right. The people on my team are everything. Like they are the reason that I get excited every day to work on what we work on is because I love them. And I feel so, 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 so lucky to work with them. Sometimes it just blows me away. The brilliant people who have you know, decided to join our team. So it wasn't that it was just having to kind of step back and be okay with the loss of getting to have that direct time playing one of the instruments. So you've talked a lot about your team and it's really great to hear how much your team means to you. It's a great trait of a leader. How would you define leadership? What does leadership mean to you? Yeah, I think there's two pieces of it, right? So I think the first piece is picking something that you care so much about that you are willing to ask other people to spend their lives working on it. 
I cannot imagine working on a problem that like deep, deep, deep down in my heart, I didn't feel was important. So I think that's the first piece is like a leader is able to choose something that really matters and have that vision of like, this is the change we're going to make in the world. The second piece, which kind of is a bit separate because I think you can do each of these independently is seeing the people as the most important thing at the company. When I sit around and I'm, you know, stressed about something with the company, of course, there's things like, you know, are we hitting our numbers? Are we doing these things? You know, whatever those kinds of metrics. But most of the time it's, does this person have what they need? I think that they might need to be taught this thing or like, oh, maybe they don't realize this or, oh, maybe I can get this person this resource. And so it's this like complete focus. Once it's other people doing that, are you making sure they have everything that you can possibly provide to them for them to do the best work of their lives? Are they feeling fulfilled? Right. Because I think that's part of it. And so to me, being a good leader is all about enabling your people you know, I can show up, I can provide, you know, a sounding board, I can help make decisions, I can do those things. But at the end of the day, they are the ones that are really moving the company forward. And so my whole job is as being a resource gatherer for them. And that resource can be all sorts of things. I want to go back for a second, because you're talking about the people and really at the end of the day, this is relationship, it's interaction. You and I've talked a little bit about Dale Carnegie how do some of the people principles that you've learned over the years or Dale Carnegie come into place when you're talking about your leadership? I always joke that the Stanford design program made me a better human because it taught me to people, right? Same with like, you know, how to win friends and influence people. It's a good, you know, guide of like, here's how to actually understand people. I think one of the best principles, and this is going to sound really vague, but I think it's at the core of everything is empathy. Like, can you sit there and say, how is this person feeling? Can you put yourself in their shoes and say, oh, you know what? They need help prioritizing or this thing happened in the org and they're probably feeling this way, right? Like I spend all of my time trying to understand how the people in the organization are feeling. So I think that that ability to empathize, that ability to connect with your team, to really know them, like especially now with everyone on Zoom and, you know, Geosite is full remote at this point, right? It's easy to forget that it's a human on the other side of the screen, right? Or on the other side of the table even. And so being able to actually treat everybody on the team as a human with all of the complexities that come with that is super important, right? So I think just realizing people are everything is one of the most important components there. People are everything and the people are worth your time to think about, to really understand. And that's an easy thing to say, right? Or to think, because I know exactly what you're talking about. And then we get into the day-to-day and all the pressures of the business and all the things that pull us and cause us stress. Yeah. How do you manage to continue to keep people at the front of what you do amidst all the stresses and responsibilities that come with being the CEO? Tiny tactical thing, like on Zoom, don't have it on tile view, turn it on speaker view. And that way you're not distracted. Like I find that that really helps. And then you can like really focus on the person that you're talking to. For me, it's, I have checkpoints with people across the company. And if people at GSI don't have checkpoints with me, they have it with somebody else on our leadership team where there's no structure to the conversation. There's no rush to the conversation. It's just, how are you doing? How are you feeling about your work? It's basically making that time And then once you have that time, all the rest of it comes through, right? Like you find out what the people care about, who they are, personality types, right? Like understanding like, hey, this person's more of an introvert or hey, this person's more of an extrovert or hey, they're moving right now, right? Like just actually caring about the personal details of people's lives. I think, you know, there's this feeling that like, oh, whatever, they can just handle their lives and like they just need to deliver their work research has shown that that sort of disposition doesn't work. Like these are human beings. And if you're looking out for your humans, they are going to be better off. The company is going to be better off into the future. As much as it's a short life, it's a long life. If you're taking care of your people, it all comes around. And I think that having a reputation that's built on the fact that you care deeply about people I think matters a lot as well. Like my team knows if they needed something, I'm there for them. Right. And that's a a good environment to work in. 
it means everything, right? When you know someone else has got your back and someone yeah. really cares about you and so forth, which leads to another thing. You know, I know you're talking about really caring about your team. And at the same time, you need to care about yourself too, right? I mean, so we need to make sure we're investing in ourselves and giving ourselves breaks and so forth. How do you deal with the stresses that you confront? Yeah, I am really good at shutting off. I think being able to kind of flip the switch and say, hey, I am not in work mode right now is super important. So I do not work on the weekends unless it is extremely urgent. For the most part, if you're managing your time well, it can happen during the week. And I find if I shut off over the weekend, I show up back on Monday, super fresh. And my team knows that too. And I feel that way for them. Like I will not bother them on the weekend. If I think of something on the weekend that I need to tell them, I'll send it, but with a delay, it will show up in their inbox on Monday. They won't see it until then. I had an advisor it was actually Heidi Roizen, who's at Threshold. She's this extraordinary investor. She's the one who runs the fellowship, the entrepreneurship fellowship that I was in. When she was teaching us, like, here's how to manage your time as an entrepreneur, the way she explained it is a startup is like a balloon. It will balloon up and fill any space that you haven't already blocked off. And so her whole thing was, you know, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your family, for your health, you know, whatever it is actually block off that time mentally and like actually in your calendar and then don't let anything impede on it. And I think once you've set aside the time, when you go into that time period, you can actually just be like, you know what, everything will be okay. And I will get back to it once I, you know, am back at my computer or back online. And so I think that that's very important. We'll force people to take time too. We'll say, Hey, you have been sprinting super hard you need to pick like three or four days at least to take off in the next month. You've been doing really extraordinary work and we refuse to let you get burnt out. So I think it's also, you know, as much as it's protecting your own time, you have to look out for the people around you too and say, Hey, you were a little off in that meeting. I think you need a minute, you know? And then it's in those moments that you find out like, oh, they, you know, had something happening in their personal life and they do need space in that moment. And it's okay. That four day will pay off tenfold over by that person being fresh. Really, really, really important to take that time. One of the most important things I'm taking away from what you said, and I know this myself, is that particularly leading a business is that the work will suck every moment of time you have if you let it. Absolutely. If we are not intentional about yeah. creating time for ourselves, for the people who are important in our lives, encouraging other people to do that, sometimes it's just never going to happen. So we have to be very intentional. That's really what I hear you saying is, you know what? I don't work on the weekends. I mean, for you to say that, mm -hmm. I don't work on the weekends. That's a hard thing to do. It's certainly not going to happen by itself if you're not intentional. Yeah. You can create culture around that, right? So like we had an employee who was taking, you know, some leave and I saw him pop up on Slack. And so I pinged him and I said, if I see you pop up on Slack again, I'm revoking your access to everything until you get back. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. I'll take a break. I'm like, I will kick you out, take the break or it will be forced setting that precedent that like, Hey, when somebody is offline, it's not a admirable thing for them to still be working while they're on vacation. I'm like, you are on a vacation you will not be here. Helping other people learn those boundaries is a part of being a good leader. They will overstep them all the time. It's the leader sets the tone. I mean, so you're talking about the culture and that's a really important role that the leader has. Any final pieces of advice? Life is short. That's uh, such a cliche, but like, I think a lot of people have always thought about starting companies or think about doing things and they get scared. And in reality, and I do this all the time, I'll think, what is the actual worst thing that could happen? Like, what is the worst case scenario on this? And I'll think through it. And I'm like, that's not actually that bad. Like, this will be fine. So I guess uh, be bold. Be bold. Life is short. And I like what you said, too, which is ask what's the worst that can happen. And frankly, it's probably not going to happen anyway. So why not exactly. take a chance? Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rachel. Tremendous interview. Really appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com 
For more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us at the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.